Hey, so we did our indie lab on microwaves, and this all sort of came from a video that we watched on YouTube where some guy explained how microwaves work, and we thought they were super cool. So we wanted to do an investigation, sort of check his work style thing. So here's what we've got. Uh, so to start off, we looked at how microwaves work, as we saw in the video. Um, so you've got the microwave set up here. You've got this uh, vacuum tube called an Agatron, which is located on this side of the microwave. It shoots uh, the microwaves out through here, uh, across the microwave. And then um, we saw that the microwaves would form wave patterns like this. And then at these points, there's going to be uh, very little wave interaction. And then at the peaks of each wave, there's going to be a lot more wave interaction. And it's important to note that this microwave is a standing wave inside the box. So there are nodes at the very end of it, and it is reflected off. And that's like a part of microwaves that's really important. And also it's important to note that the magnetron is on one side of the microwave and it's shooting waves into the microwave one direction. It's not all around the box. So it's, it's not being irradiated from all sides. It's coming from one direction and going through the box and bouncing back. Yep. Uh, and then we have that equation there, which is just a useful thing that we're going to be using later in our experiment. Um, so this is just sort of about how magnetrons work. Do we have time to answer a question, Doc? Or should we wait till afterwards? Uh, you should probably wait till afterwards. Okay. You jot a little note. Sorry. Okay, anyway, uh, magnetrons are super cool. It's essentially a ooh, let me see if I can, yeah, cathode is in the middle, and then there's an anode on the outside. It's got this funky shape with these little holes in the side, and um, the current runs through that way. And what happens is because there's a magnetic field inside of it, the current actually shifts and electrons are spun around in a circle that way inside the magnetron and they pass these little holes where they excite the electrons inside the holes sort of in the same way that blowing on the top of a bottle creates some resonant frequency and makes a sound. Uh, it's very similar to that process and those ele excited electrons create the microwaves that come into the box. They're fed up through a piece called the antenna which you can see right here and this is sort of the microwave inside a cooling fin, and here are the two magnets that create the magnetic field. And what happens inside of your food when it's in the microwave, um, first of all, it's important to note that it only microwaves things that are uh, high in water, fat, or sugars, because inside water, fat, and sugars, there's water, and water is super cool, it's polar, and when it is interacted with by a light wave, it flips around and it aligns itself to the direction of that magnetic uh, wave. And so you can see in this diagram that as the electric field inverts, as it does in microwaves, the water molecule shifts and like jiggles back and forth like this. And that uh, extra kinetic energy is what the heat is coming from. And that's super cool because what's happening is your food is being heated throughout the food wherever it's interacting with that microwave. And so that was sort of the basis of our experiments, is sort of figuring out where that microwave is and what it's doing. Um, so taking all this knowledge, applying it into our experiment, uh, first thing we did uh, was take out the uh, spinning tray at the bottom, because that uh, tries to move your food through the standing waves uh, more evenly, so that it can get heated, all the water molecules are evenly heated and flipped back and forth. Uh, so we got rid of that, put a cup over the top of that, and then a plate of cheese, because cheese is pretty easily melted in a microwave. Um, so you can see here the waves uh, moving that would move uh, across the plate of cheese, and we expected there to be um, very like melted parts of cheese here, almost no melted cheese, lots more melted cheese, etc. as it went. Uh, and then we just repeated that a few times to uh, identify uh, how large the waves were. And it should be said before we leave this slide that the main experiment we were doing here was measuring the distance between the um, maximums, the antinodes of the wave to figure out how long they were and how they were interacting with the food. And that's why we were doing an experiment like this. We could have done other experiments involving temperature and distributions inside the microwave, but we were really interested in this uh, standing wave and exactly where it was and like <coughs> sort of trying to figure out what the most effective place in the microwave to place your food to get the maximum heating. And that was sort of the core of our lab uh, in addition to like understanding microwaves in general. Um, our hypothesis is 
this. Essentially, we thought that by putting cheese in the microwave, we would find melted spots of cheese in some spots because it wasn't rotating, and unmelted spots in others. And using that, we'd be able to draw some lines in between them and say, hey, we have waves. And um, as Gavin said, we just put a cup over the little motor that spins the plate around, and we took the plate out so that it wouldn't spin, so that we wouldn't get some weird stuff going on. Uh, so this is the data that we collected. So here, going back, we uh, measured as many of these, uh, like half wavelength, the distances between the anti nodes, as we could. That seems like they were um, uh, distinct uh, patterns of melted cheese. So then we got, uh, we did four tries. It looks like yeah, uh, two in two different microwaves. So we measured multiple distances between uh, those nodes of melted cheese, um, averaged them all out, used the uh, earlier equation, wavelength equals C over F, yeah, uh, to find the wavelength, or the other way around. The frequency. Yeah. That's what for. Uh, yeah, to find the frequency, and then we uh, took those frequent, or I think errors on the next page. Yeah. So yeah, so we used that to find uh, an average frequency for our microwaves. Um, so error was interesting with this. We had to look up the given frequencies of these microwaves in the manuals that both of us didn't have. So there was a lot of Google searching going on in that part. And we got good error. Like it's not 100 million percent or anything. We got 33 and 51 percent. That's not unreasonable. And we attribute a lot of that error to the fact that we were literally using cheese to do this lab. Like, I feel like cheese is not a very scientific medium to study, um, especially with something. It's not very accurate. And we ended up with melty spots that were like this big. So we just sort of had to guess where the middle of that was to find the center of the wave. And we probably could have been more accurate if we were using like temperature sensors in a complex matrix and something. but. We didn't want to deal with that, and plus melting cheese was kind of fun. So, cheese kind of screwed us over, but we ended up eating it later, and it was delicious. Um, and yeah, is there anything else on this slide? Um, just that uh, maybe using like another medium besides cheese obviously would have been good, yeah. because cheese also can like, train, I guess it's not like water where it'll transfer heat very easily between itself. Um, we, we also noticed that we had to use uh, like shredded cheese, we tried at first using sliced cheese, Didn't which was an expensive mistake. Um, it ended up just melting on the outside, and we don't really know why that was, because it should have melted on the inside also, but after reading up on the internet a little more, I found out that microwaves usually only heat the first few centimeters of your food, and that seemed contradictory to how I understood microwaves worked, so that's something that we might want to investigate further uh, if we had another year to do an uh, indie lab of some sort, but college, you know. Um, in conclusion to this lab, we found out that using cheese, we were able to estimate the wavelength of a microwave, which was super cool because you can't see microwaves when you're microwaving food, but with this experiment we were able to really easily visualize the microwaves that were shown in the diagrams we found on the internet, and just something that happens in our life all the time. Um, I just wanted to reiterate in this slide that we used cheese. I like the I put in caps and it stuff. Was very cool. It was it was a great. scientific experiment. Yeah, and then we concluded that our frequencies were these numbers here, and those are pretty close to the given frequencies within 50 percent, mm -hmm. um, which right. means we got really close for cheese. Yeah, um, and then in the future again, uh, we would be uh, want to use like temperature sensors or an infrared camera because that would allow us to get very precise readings about where the center of uh, these like more heated areas are, and then that would give us a lot better uh, data taking. Yeah. That's it. Take any questions? Ben? What? Um, I have two. Okay. First of all, uh, cheese is made from milk, correct? Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, and second of all, what is the... Uh, what you said, we're talking about the vacuum tube inside the microwave. And the yeah, the <laughs> what was the uh, what is the purpose of the vacuum tube? So uh, does every microwave have a vacuum tube? Yeah, this is called a magnetron, okay. and it does. This is what produces the microwaves that get sent into the box, and it does that by spinning an electric current around through here and exciting electrons that are in these holes, yeah. which 
go woo, and then release energy as they fall back down to a less excited state. And that process is similar to um, like blowing over a bottle to make that noise. Okay. And the three or four videos I watched on the internet were all this really, really old guy trying to explain it, and he did it really slowly, and he kept like skipping things. So my understanding of exactly how magnetrons work is a little shaky, especially because this was a while ago, but that's essentially what it's doing. And then it feeds that uh, wave up through this little piece here. It's called the antenna. And yeah. That creates a vacuum? No, it creates a microwave. There's no vacuum tube. Oh. Vacuum tubes are the things that they used in old computers as semiconductors, I think. What? You said there was a vacuum tube. Where's the vacuum? The magnetron is a ma yeah. in, a, in a vacuum. Yes. I think it's like a very special vacuum tube. Oh, that's this. Called a magnetron. Oh, yeah, there might be a vacuum tube there, but that's not what the vacuum... Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's not what the magnetron is. Okay. The vacuum tube Tell, tell me about the vacuum tube then, man. Uh, I think he's mistaken. Uh, the vacuum tube is yeah. the magnetron. Yeah. Oh. This is okay. Yeah. yeah. So the magnetron creates a vacuum. No. Oh. So what's a vacuum? I believe there's a vacuum in that tube. So the magnetron <laughs> is <laughs> held within, <laughs> and then the magnetron shoots microwaves. Here, here's here's what really happens. I've got it. In the vacuum tube, there's the magnetron, and then the creators of the microwave take the milk and they pour it in the yeah. vacuum tube. Okay. And then the electrons excite the milk and create the melted cheese. Oh, that explains it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dean, if you wanted to have electrons spinning around in a circle, would you like them to be in a vacuum? Yeah. Or would it be okay if they would run into, say, a nitrogen molecule? No, that'd be pretty bad. Uh, right, bad. so uh, obviously the okay. magnetron is a vacuum tube, just so that it can be electrons spinning around in a circle happily. Oh, I lost my diagram, I think. None of the diagrams had a vacuum. But that does make sense. We do, we do want to vacuum. Any other questions? I have a lot I, of questions. I actually Robbie. have a legitimate Robbie, what's question. Up? You might have already said this, but what kind of cheese did you use oh and why? Uh, I think like, we used Colby <laughs> Schnucks <laughs> melted cheese because it's pretty cheap and I like Colby cheese, so any yeah. cheese we didn't microwave, so exactly, I could use later. So it's not any kind of ratio of like, the milkiness of it. We did not take no. data for that, no. No, so at my house we were using sharp cheddar I was, I was and shred bomb. Can we? Fun of this experiment. Yeah, no, 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 no. This, this is, that's actually a pretty valid question. We did not take any data on the milk content of our cheese, although I will say that all cheese is just milk with bacteria in it, so it was all pretty much 100% milk. Can you take us back to the first slide? Uh, I'd like to ask some questions that are slide dependent. Yeah. Uh, this is a great place. Um, first, uh, oh, you know what? Yeah. Okay, 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 right, 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 right. Um, why do they put the magnetron, as shown in that picture, a little bit less than halfway up? Could they put it anywhere vertically, and how did they decide to put it there? So, what happens is, um, actually part of our conclusion that we didn't go over, so I'm glad you're asking this question. They want, they understand that you're putting your food in the bottom of the microwave, and those waves only get so big, and I don't think they go all the way to the top of the microwave, which would make sense for why they're putting it down. Because they're assuming that your food is not going to fully fill the box, so it actually uses less energy to create those smaller amplitude waves, I believe. And so by putting it closer to the bottom, they're ensuring that the microwaves are going to reach your food on the bottom, even if you're microwaving shredded cheese, which is really thin, on the bottom layer. And um, that way they don't have to use that extra energy. And then sort of, as an extra part of our conclusion that I'm going to say now, we found that um, because of the way the carousel spins, you go through more of those nodes if you are on the outside of the carousel as opposed to the middle. So if you're putting your food in the very dead center of the microwave, it's not going to get heated properly. And if you've ever microwaved cold pizza and parts of it have still been cold, it's probably because you put it in the middle. So if you're looking to heat your food really effectively, put it as far to the outside of the carousel as it... Wow as far to the outside of the carousel as you can, because then it's going to go through all of those nodes as it rotates around. You yeah. spoke about the amplitude of the wave. Can you reconcile that view of light as a wave with the uh, particle nature of light, where the greater intensity of light is actually greater number of photons? Yeah. The amplitude <laughs> of the wave, like a physical separation, is that what you mean? Like a physical separation between the top and bottom of the wave as amplitude? Or is it just more microwaves? 
Um, what does amplitude mean for light? It was my understanding that it was a higher energy if it was a higher amplitude. And so by talking, uh, one wave is the, that's the photon traveling, and it's represented as a wave and a particle at the same time, if, depending on how you're looking at it. And so if you give it more energy, the wave aspect will have a higher amplitude, I believe. And I don't, uh, I could be wrong. So does that mean it actually takes up more space in the microwave as it zooms across? Probably not, no. That doesn't make sense since I don't think photons have any volume, do they? <coughs> Shut the down. Okay, so um, are you familiar, can you go to the next slide, there was a dancing, um, yeah, keep going until there's the, that guy, right, are you familiar with Will Smith's song, um, Getting Jiggy With It? I am not. Okay, yeah. you should look it up. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? That, did you vary heights of the cup, or was this a randomly chosen cup height? We put the cup at the top. It was near the it top. It was close yeah. to the top, yeah. Oh. It wasn't at the very top, but it was pretty close. So the thinking behind that was that um, uh, with the light moving as a sort of wave, um, that it would be exposed to greater differences. Uh, so if it was closer to the top, then it wouldn't uh, like be in the middle here. We wanted to hit the peaks. Yeah, the so it would hit the stark contrast between the peaks and then no waves in the peaks. Although to be fair, if we had put it at any height, I think we would have just gotten like this point and that point and that point. Yeah, those it would have been a similar point. So it would have been shifted over. Maybe. I have four more questions that I'm not going to ask, but the last question I'm going to ask is about the error. Could you go to the next slide until you say, there, this would, oh, back, 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 back. Okay, what is the frequency of um, Dean's microwave? Is that the left one? Yeah, uh, 1.13, or, or calculated 1.19E9. And go up, does it say up, up, just up there? Up, 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 up there. Is that the frequency of the microwave up there? Where? Oh, it's four trials. Yeah. And yeah. nowhere here have you listed the printed frequency. Correct. Yeah. We did that on the next page. Okay, I had thought that perhaps it was listed over there. Um, so they both have the same frequency. Mm -hmm. R2 microbes, yeah. I think it's a pretty common frequency. Does that mean that they have to have the same geometry? Because it has to be a, a fixed number of half waves? I think, so microwave manufacturers, I did some research trying to find it, and they make the boxes of different sizes, but I think they make it so that the boxes are an appropriate size. And also, the wavelengths are kind of tiny. Show me. Or, that's wrong. I'm sorry. It's You can see with our experiment that they're... They're microwaves, they're not tiny, that was a mistake. Um, but yeah, I think that the microwave manufacturers just make sure that they're making it so that it's, the like distance across is a node. So if they vary it, they're varying each model by like three inches or however many inches it is. That's gross, don't use inches. I, you gotta I just, go to college, you know, I won't be I able just, to tell you to stop using inches. So. I just, I picked the this first is unit. I could have said. Gross. Uh, okay, show me with your finger how, how wide these are, these quarter, these half waves, right? About that wide, okay, so microwaves can only come in that size, difference from one another. Yeah, that's something I understand. Wow. And then if, so they could also vary the frequency though, inside, if they wanted to make a different sized model. Yeah, and I'm, so, sure, I'm sure varying the frequency by a small amount wouldn't uh, be that like, harmful to the effectiveness of the microwave, yeah. and then you could edit your size accordingly. And so Gavin and I's microwave were either the exact same Ours were also the light. same manufacturer, I believe. Yeah, they're different models, true. but they're both like Panasonic or something, I don't know. Thank you. Yep.